Hi everybody, welcome back to the discussion of chapter 2, Cell Structures and Functions, but in this video, we will be focusing on subtopic 2.5, Animal and Plant Tissues. These are the learning objectives that you need to complete by the end of the lesson. At the end of the lesson, students should be able to explain the various types of animal cells and tissues. These include epithelial cells, nerve cells, muscle cells, and also connective tissues. The students should also be able to explain the various types of plant cells and tissues. These include meristem tissue, ground tissue, and also the vascular tissue. Let's begin by learning about the animal tissues first. There are four types of animal tissues that you need to learn. Firstly, the nervous tissue, followed by the epithelial tissue. And then we have the muscle tissue, and lastly, the connective tissue. Let's begin by learning about the nervous tissue. The nervous tissue is the tissue that is responsible for receiving, processing, and transmitting impulse in the body. There are two types of cells that make up the nervous tissue. Firstly, the glial cells. The glial cells support, nourish, protect, and remove products of metabolisms from neurons. From here, you know that the second type of cell that make up the nervous tissue is the neuron. Neurons are the cells that actually transmitting and receiving impulse. There are three types of neurons. The first one is known as the sensory neuron or afferent neuron. Sensory neuron carry impulses from the sensory receptors towards the central nervous system. The central nervous system that consists of the brain and also the spinal cord is made up by the second type of neuron known as the interneuron. The interneuron is known to perform integration or in other words, perform thinking. The third type of neuron is known as the motor neuron, or the efferent neuron. Motor neuron carry impulses out of the central nervous system towards the effectors. For your syllabus, you are only required to learn about motor neuron in detail. This is the structure of a motor neuron. A refers to the dendrites. The dendrites carry impulses from the neighboring neuron towards the cell body. B refers to the cell body. It contains the organelles of the cell, such as the big black dot in the middle here, known as the nucleus, and also other organelles, such as the Golgi body. C refers to an extension that come out of the cell body. It is known as the exon. The exon will carry impulse away from the cell body. The exon will branch into many branches with swollen tips. This swollen tip is known as the synaptic knob. The synaptic knob will connect with other dendrites of the other neuron. As you can see, some area of the exon is covered by D. D is known as the myelin sheath. The myelin sheath is made up of cells known as the Schwann cells that is rich in fat, therefore a poor electrical conductor. This causes the impulse to jump from one node of Ranvier to the next node of Ranvier, speeding up the impulse transmission. F refers to the region that is not covered by the myelin sheath. This region is known as the node of Ranvier. Next, the epithelial tissue. The epithelial tissue covers the outside of the body and lines the various cavities inside the body. For example, like the oral cavity. It protects the body against mechanical injury. It also acts as a barrier for entry of pathogens that will cause diseases. Epithelial tissue also protects our body from fluid loss. When talking about epithelial tissue, you need to know that all epithelial tissue will sit on top of a membrane called the basal lamina or the basement membrane. When discussing about a particular epithelial tissue, you first need to mention how many layers of cells does the tissue have. 
This is then followed by what shape of cells does the tissue made up of. In terms of layering, if the epithelial tissue is made up from just a single layer of cell, we will use the term simple. However, if the epithelial tissue is made up from multiple layers of epithelial cells, we will use the term stratified. If the epithelial cells making up a particular tissue is a flat cell, the flat epithelial cells is known as the squamous cell. The cube epithelial cells is known as the cuboidal cells. The column-shaped epithelial cells is known as the columnar cells. Now, based on what we have just learned, let's try and name each of these epithelial tissues. The first one would be simple squamous epithelial tissue. The second one would be simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. The third one would be simple columnar epithelial tissue. And the last one would be stratified squamous epithelial tissue. This epithelial tissue is named as simple squamous epithelial tissue because it is made up of a single layer of flat-shaped cells. Because of this, simple squamous epithelial tissue is perfect for exchange of substances through rapid diffusion. Hence, simple squamous epithelial tissue can be commonly found in the lining of blood capillaries and also linings of air sacs called the alveolus in the lungs. As you can see here, the lining of the alveolus in the lung is made up of a single layer of flat cells and also the blood capillary covering the alveolus is also made of single layer of flat cells. This is to reduce resistance for the exchange of respiratory gases that takes place in the lungs. Next, this epithelial tissue is known as the simple cuboidal epithelial tissue because it is made up of a single layer of cube-shaped cells. Simple cuboidal epithelial tissue is perfect for secretion and absorption. Therefore, it could be commonly found in the lining of kidney tubules like this. This is a cross-section of kidney tubules and also form the various glands like salivary glands and also the thyroid gland. This tissue is known as simple columnar epithelial tissue because it is made up from just a single layer of column-shaped cells. Just like the simple cuboidal epithelial tissue, simple columnar epithelial tissue also responsible for secretion and absorption. The simple columnar epithelial tissue can be commonly found in the lining of the digestive tract. This is the longitudinal section of villus in your intestine. As you can see, the villus is made from simple columnar epithelial tissue. Although there is a slight modification here, each of the columnar epithelial cells possess finger-like projection at one end called the microvilli to increase the surface area of nutrient absorption in the intestine. This epithelial tissue is known as the stratified squamous epithelial tissue because it is made up from a multiple layer of flat-shaped cells. As you can see, the cells near the basal lamina or the basement membrane is cube-shaped cells, and these cells are actively dividing to replace the flattened cells at the top that get sloughed off due to frictions. Stratified squamous epithelial tissue give a protection against friction and chemical damages. It can be commonly found lining the outer layer of the skin and also other places that often faces damages from frictions such as lining the oral cavity, the anus and also the vagina. Could you imagine how bloody your oral cavity would get when you're eating a nice, hard, crispy ayam goreng McDonald's if it is only made up from simple squamous epithelial tissue? It is very scary to imagine. Muscle tissue. Muscle tissue is responsible for all types of movement. There are three types of muscle tissues. 
we have the smooth muscle, the cardiac muscle, and also the skeletal muscle. The cells of the smooth muscle are spindle in shape with tapered end. Unlike the cells in the cardiac muscles, which are elongated and cylindrical in shape, with branch at the end, as you can see in the diagram. The shape of the skeletal muscle cells are similar to the shape of the cardiac muscle cells. It is elongated and cylindrical in shape. However, the skeletal muscle cells are unbranched. The smooth muscle cells are uninucleated or only possess a single nucleus, as you can see in the diagram and the nucleus is centrally located. For cardiac muscle cells, it contains one or two nucleus per cell, and the nucleus is also centrally located. However, skeletal muscle cells are multinucleated, or in other words, one cell have many nuclei. This can be clearly observed in the diagram. Each of the muscle fiber or the muscle cell possess multiple nuclei, and the nuclei are pushed to the periphery or to the side of the cell. The striation is absent in the smooth muscle, meanwhile present in both cardiac and the skeletal muscle. The smooth muscle contract very slowly, unlike the skeletal muscle that contract very fast. The speed of contraction of the cardiac muscle varies based on the stimulation from the brain. Although the smooth muscle contract very very slow, the smooth muscle can contract for a very very long time because it has the highest or the greatest resistance to fatigue. The cardiac muscle have intermediate resistance to fatigue, meanwhile the skeletal muscle has the least resistance to fatigue or in other words, the skeletal muscle will easily feel tired and cannot contract for a very long time. Both the smooth muscle and the cardiac muscle are under involuntary control. This means that their contraction does not need conscious stimulations. However, the skeletal muscle is under voluntary control. The smooth muscle can be found in places such as the iris pincher muscle in the eyes that controls the opening of the iris of the eye in different light condition, or the wall of the artery, and also the wall of the intestine that create a peristaltic movement. Cardiac muscle can be found in the wall of the heart. Meanwhile, skeletal muscle can be found attached to the bones at tendons. There is a structure in the cardiac muscle known as the intercalated disc. This disc allows communications between cardiac cells for sequential contraction of the heart. Now, let's learn about the connective tissue. The common feature of all the connective tissues is that they are made up of sparse population of cells scattered in an extracellular matrix. They hold many tissues and organs in place. The matrix can be solid, jelly-like, or liquid. If the matrix is solid, it will form compact bone. If it's jelly-like, it will form hyaline cartilage. And an example of connective tissue with liquid matrix is the blood. Now let's learn about the compact bone first. Compact bone protect the internal organs. It provides shape and structure to the body. It also acts as the attachment site for skeletal muscles for movement. It also acts as the reservoir for calcium and phosphorus. The bone contains bone marrow that acts as the site for blood cell production. Compact bone can be found in many places in your body. For example, your skull, your rib cage, and also your backbone. This is the structure of your compact bone. It is made up of many, many E. E is known as the osteon or haversian system. It is a functional unit of compact bone. Each osteon is made up of many, many concentric circles labeled A, known as the lamellae. The lamellae is the layers of hardened matrix of the compact bone. Initially, the matrix of the bone is made up from the flexible collagen. 
which then harden because of the deposition of calcium, magnesium, and potassium ions. B refers to the space in the hardened matrix. This space is known as the lacuna. Lacuna contains the bone cell known as the osteocyte. The osteocyte from one lacuna can communicate with the other osteocyte in the next lacuna via C, which is known as the canaliculi. All of the cells in the lacuna will get their nutrients from the blood supply in D. D is known as the Haversian canal. The Haversian canal contains blood vessels that carry the nutrients towards the osteon to be supplied to osteocytes in various lacuna and it takes waste away from the osteon. As you can see, one osteon and the next osteon is connected via Volkmann's canal. Now, let's learn about the hyaline cartilage. The hyaline cartilage cover the end of bones to reduce frictions during movement. They provide strong but yet flexible support. Hyaline cartilage can be found in nose, ears, and also at the end of long bones. This is the matrix of the cartilage. It is composed of a substance known as chondroitin sulfate. This substance is secreted by cells known as the chondrocytes that lives in the spaces in the matrix known as the lacuna. The last of the connective tissue is the blood. This is a diagram of a centrifuged blood. 52 to 62% of the blood is made up of its plasma. 91% of plasma is made up of water, thus making the blood to flow easily. Besides that, there are many other dissolved proteins and hormones and gases in this plasma. The white blood cells in the blood will be suspended in this area, followed by the platelets and then the red blood cells. Now let's have a look at blood at cellular level. These are the red blood cells, or erythrocytes. It carries respiratory gases such as the oxygen and carbon dioxide around the body. There are several adaptations of the red blood cell that makes it suitable to perform this task. Firstly, it is biconcave this shape to increase surface area for gas diffusion to occur. The red blood cells contain no nucleus. This is so they could store more hemoglobin so that it can carry more oxygen. The red blood cells also possess no mitochondria so that the oxygen that they carry will not be consumed. The red blood cells are also very flexible so that they can squeeze through narrow blood capillaries. The white blood cells play an important role in defending or protecting the body against pathogens. The white blood cells can be grouped based on the presence of granules in their cytoplasm. Granulocytes refers to those white blood cells with granules in the cytoplasm. Meanwhile, a granulocytes refers to those white blood cells with no granules in their cytoplasm. Platelets play a very important role in blood clotting. They originate from the cytoplasmic pinch-off of the cells in the bone marrow.